All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for attending this special seminar this afternoon. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Kathy Ann O'Malley. I'm a professor in fisheries and wildlife in the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Felix Vo, who's a postdoctoral research associate in my lab. Well, at least for the next 24 hours. <laughs> um, Felix completed his bachelor's degree at Exeter University in the UK and his PhD at Massey University in New Zealand, uh, where he studied the evolutionary lineages of New Zealand whelks. So I hired Felix to specifically work on this albacore tuna project, um, which he's going to talk about today. But since he arrived in January of 2018, Felix has done much more than that. And so I want to highlight what he's accomplished over his time here at HMSC. So first, he made substantial contributions to a paper that we already had in prep on Arctic char, and that was recently published uh, earlier this year. He then was enthusiastic about the opportunity to collaborate um, with Leif Rasmussen and his team on a project that they motivated on Deacon Rockfish. And this paper was just recently accepted and is in press and may be released as early as next week. Felix and I also co-supervised an RU intern this summer, and this uh, individual, Hannah Acock, was looking to develop uh, genetic sex identification markers in rockfish, and so Felix is the lead author on this paper, which will be submitted in the next month or so. And then, of course, he is the lead author on our Abacor tuna paper, which he's going to present on today. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Okay, so today we talk about the population structure of a highly migratory species, the albacore tuna. So I've been doing this work, obviously, with Kathleen O'Malley, but also with Sandra Bon in the State Fisheries Genomics Lab here at Oregon State University. So I just want to begin by talking about the motivations for the project and knowledge of people involved. So this project was really started by Rick Gaucher, who's right here. <laughs> Um, so Rick Gaucher and Wayne Hakeler both noticed that a large number of albacore samples were held at the Southwest Fishery Science Center. Um, and they're interested in the potential extinction of possible stocks of albacore on the west coast. So they actually reached out to Kathleen O'Malley and they suggested that she apply for the South and Stool Kennedy Grant Funds, which fortunately for my sake she did get. And um, in collaboration with John Hyde at the Southwest Fishery Science Centre, the project was about able to begin. And during the course of the project, we've made sure to reach out to other institutions, um, including the South Pacific Marine Community, the South Pacific Community (SPC) and uh, CSIRO with Peter Grew, and that allowed us to gain access to a wider range of samples from across the Pacific. And we're planning to share data and samples in the future. So, just to kick off some background, the very first thing I want you to remember are that albacore are an organism; um, they're not just food. So they're a highly migratory species. They've got a lot of adaptations to do with fast swimming fast and swimming long distances. Albacore have got these uh, really long pectoral fins that give them extra lift in water, which makes them more energy efficient. Uh, they're warm-blooded or endothermic, and they are just really fast apex predators. They hunt in large schools. Um, but yeah, the main thing I want you to remember about that is that they're highly migratory. But as I'm sure you're aware, albacore are also pretty good food. And so they actually support one of the largest marine fisheries in the world. So um, it's the fourth most landed tuna species globally. Uh, it's a crucial fishery here in Oregon, but it's also really important for a lot of developing states in the South Pacific and also in Southeast Asia. Most of the fishing nowadays is by hook and line or troll fishing, but there's also long line fishing and person seine fishing. Now because albacore are found throughout most of the world's ocean, uh, there's a lot of overlapping jurisdictions for managing the species. Here in the Pacific, we've got two overlapping jurisdictions between two different regional fisheries management organizations. And so it's quite a complicated species to think about from a fisheries management and conservation perspective. So some of the issues that managers and conservationists are interested in are how many populations there are of albacore, because it's something we're not actually certain about. And related to that, how many stocks there are. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to treat a population as a stock as being interchangeable, but they're not necessarily the same. Stocks often involve um, practical limitations for management or international boundaries and things like that. And then we also don't really know very much about the migration cycle of albacore. So we know that they, they definitely migrate. And they're, they're highly migratory species going over long distances, but we don't really know a lot of the time where they're going. And we also obviously want to have a good idea of the risk of overfishing for the species. 
and we want to know how they may respond to climate change. So just to give you an example of the level of uncertainty we have for Albacore, these are maps from a recent study by Nicola Cattell. They're showing the estimated distribution for Albacore in the North Pacific and in the Atlantic. And what you can see is that a lot of regions on the map are really broadly colored. Um, so you can see that certain positions and maps also have question marks next to them, and that's simply because we don't know if the albacore are there or not. And this map is based on fisheries catch data, but also tagging data. But unfortunately, tagging on albacore hasn't had great success until recently. So traditionally, they've only been getting about 5% of tags returns for tag to albacore. And there have been some previous genetic studies using a small number of markers, um, but they haven't provided a great deal of insight, if only to differentiate um, say the Pacific from the Atlantic. And crucially as well, here in the North Pacific, there's only been genetic sampling from California. So, like I said, Rick Gershaw and Wayne Hickler were interested in the distinction of two potential stocks here on the West Coast. So, there's evidence to indicate that there's a northern and a southern stock. So, the northern stock goes from northern California up to British Columbia, and the southern stock is centered on southern California and Baja California. The reason for this distinction is based on differences in the length of the fish when they're the same age. And uh, tagging with improved tagging methods has shown that these fish tend to forage within different areas and don't necessarily overlap. And these differences seem to be maintained for long enough to persist in their oxalate microchemistry as well. So in terms of the risk of overfishing, at the moment, pretty much all abacor stocks are assessed to be stable. Um, but a large number of models included in most uh, management reports do indicate that there's a risk of overfishing in the future. So if you look at the graphs here, for example, uh, you can see that if we maintain constant fishing intensity and constant catch rates from the periods shown, there is a risk of either stability or actual decline within the next 20 years. And so Having genetic evidence to affect that, affect that assessment would be important. And on a more local level, here in, here in Oregon, uh, landings have been highly variable. So uh, in the 1960s, or late 1960s, we were catching around 38 million pounds of albacore, but this has declined in the 2000s to around 9.5 million pounds. And when you look at things like news headlines, the last two years, the commercial catch was down. Um, but this year, the recreational catch has actually been quite high. So there's a lot of variability and unpredictability in what's going to happen each year. And in the past, um, there was historic stock collapses in both Hawaii and California as well. And so it's something you want to keep in our minds for the future. And with climate change, uh, albacore are already being affected by climate change. So in the North Atlantic, albacore are migrating about a week earlier compared to 50 years ago. And with the blob here in the North Pacific, it's been observed that competitor species such as skipjack tuna are expanding in their range as well. And in the next 20 years, models have predicted that we're likely to see a poleward shift in the distribution of albacore away from the equator. And that's likely to result in sparser populations. Simultaneously, increased sea surface temperatures are likely to reduce, result in less prey, which means reduced population sizes for albacore as well. So likely to have sparser populations and fewer albacore in the future. Now there was one model um, by Lahodia al, which is shown at the bottom, and that's showing the predicted change in biomass for albacore within the next hundred years. And you can see that both for juveniles and adults, the darker the blue coloration, the bigger the decline in tons per kilometer squared. So there's likely to be quite serious impacts for the albacore fishery with climate change. So for this study, because we're interested in those that northern and southern potential west coast stocks, we're going to focus on the, on the Pacific Ocean. So to walk you through, here I've shown the distribution of albacore in the North Pacific based on that previous fisheries catch data and tagging data. This distribution is occupied by both juveniles and adults. So the juvenile distribution, the juveniles are between two to five or six years old whereas adults are five or six years old and older. They can live to about 21 years, but I think the average life expectancy is around 16 years. If you're wondering where fish below two years are, they're planktonic and are carried on the ocean currents within the Pacific. 
Now within this region we do have a rough idea of where the spawning area is, but as you can see it's really broadly estimated. It's much more likely that albacore spawn within much more localized locations within this area, but we simply don't know where they are. And in addition, we don't really know anything about albacore reproductive behavior either. So there's a lot of unknowns about what's going on with albacore reproduction. Now, like I said, we don't know much about the migration of albacore, but in the Pacific, in the North Pacific, I should say, we're fairly privileged to have a, a, a fairly good idea of what's happening. So, in 1963, Otson Achiever proposed the model. It's based on mainly tagging, and it's been supported by subsequent studies over the decades. I will say now that it is only a model, so some albacores are in the complete wrong direction at a complete wrong time of year, but the prevailing trend generally holds true. So, most juveniles are found along the west coast, and then in September and October, they start leaving the west coast. And this coincides with a lot of the fishing that occurs here. They then swim out to a midway point that's around 170 degrees west and 40 degrees north, where that number one is. And then they return throughout the rest of the year back to the west coast. So juveniles are doing this, but it's also possible for juveniles to swim out to that midway point and then swim towards Japan. And increasingly, as the fish age, an increasing number of them swim within that second ellipse. So you have, instead, some fish will be swimming a figure of eight, and others will be swimming for maybe the first two years off the west coast, and that's that midway point, but then they'll switch to swimming towards Japan. So you get a demographic shift where you have older juveniles towards Japan and younger juveniles towards North America. So when these fish reach reproductive maturity and become adults at five or six years old, they swim towards the spawning grounds, so they're at the right part of the migration cycle. We don't know the exact route that they take, so these arrows shown here are really speculative, but we know that they migrate between March and April. Once the adults are within that region, we haven't got a great idea of where they go. So certainly, at certain times of the year, like in Hawaii or in other places, you can catch a lot of adult albacore, but we don't really know where they're going for the remainder of the year. Um, it could be that they're remaining resident within that spawning area. It could be that they're rejoining the migration cycle. Or it could be that they have a different migration cycle and it's just not been shown by previous tagging. And the reason why it hasn't to a great deal is that most tagging has been done at juveniles. And you'll note that there are two arrows at the bottom of the map with question marks next to them. And that's just to illustrate the fact that it's entirely possible that albacore are moving between the North and South Pacific or any other of the world's oceans. So for this study, I'm just going to go over our sampling. So for the North Pacific, we had 10 sample sites. Now we wanted to focus on that potential northern and southern stock. So on the west coast, we had six sample sites going from Baja, California to British Columbia. Three of those were classified within the southern west coast group. So Baja, California, Southern California, and Northern California. And then we also had a group of uh, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia as the Northern West Coast group. We then had samples from Hawaii. One sample area was close to the Hawaiian Islands itself. The other one was much closer to about 110 degrees west and 40 degrees north midway point. And then we also had samples from Japan and the Philippine Sea. But like I said, we wanted to know if albacore were moving between the North and South Pacific as well and the North Pacific doesn't exist in isolation. So we made sure to expand the study and include samples from New Caledonia, and which is the NC on the map, and Tasmania as well. And you can see from this map, just in the North Pacific, we have a much better idea about how albacore are migrating, whereas in the South Pacific, there's a lot more uncertainty. <coughs> so in total, we sequenced successfully 308 albacore. Um, we have a decent number of samples from most of our sample areas, apart from Baja, California, and British Columbia, which is the BA and BC on the label table. Uh, these sample areas didn't sequence as well because they, we were using liver tissue for these samples and the DNA preservation was not as good. Uh, we've noticed that this is a recurrent problem in other studies, genetic studies of albacore, and so we don't think this is unusual. Um, but most of the sample areas, you've got a reasonable number of samples. You might be wondering why we don't have hundreds of samples per area, and that's simply because the DNA sequencing method we're using sequences a lot of sites, and so we can sequence fewer individuals. 
Now, there are two things that we need to pay attention to that are limitations to the study. So firstly, um, our samples are collected over many different years and many different seasons. So there's a lot of temporal variation to go with the spatial variation. And in addition, we've got a mixture of juveniles and adults. So we need to be really careful when interpreting the data that any patterns we're observing aren't related to this temporal variation or difference in age class. And another thing that I think is really important to remember is that our sample areas should not be treated as potential populations. So oh, they, should be treat, they shouldn't be assumed to be populations. And that's because it's a highly migratory species. So if we catch albacore, or if we catch one school of albacore sampling individuals from Oregon in 2016, it's entirely possible we could catch fish from the same school off British Columbia in 2017. So, a lot of population genetic statistics assume that your sample groups are the same as populations, and we need to be really careful when using those statistics for this data set. And then another issue to consider is that in highly migratory species, males and females quite often have quite different migration cycles. So particularly in sharks, such as salmon sharks, males and females often migrate very differently, go to completely different locations. And we know that in albacore, um, certain sample areas are likely to be male biased because there's a female biased mortality at old age. So for instance, when we catch fish from Hawaii or the Philippine Sea, they're likely to be mostly male. And that might have implications for trying to interpret the population genetic variation and the migration cycle. In addition, from a more population genetic perspective, but it's still important, um, biases in the sex ratio of our sampling can be really misleading. So what this graph is showing here is it's from a recent study looking at Arctic char, and they're looking at estimates of the fixation index, or pairwise FST. And basically what's happened is if, you have, if you're comparing two groups, the fixation index tries to estimate genetic differentiation between the two. How different are those groups? And if one of your groups has got a really strong sex bias, it's going to actually really bias this estimate of genetic differentiation. And so we want to avoid that when we're interpreting our data. Or if there is a bias, we want to be aware of it. So I'm just going to go through our DNA sequencing method now. So for this study, we didn't use traditional markers. We instead use uh, double digest restriction site associated DNA sequencing, or DDRAD sequencing. And I'll try and explain that simply. So basically, we get tiny tissue clippings from each albacore. We then extract genomic DNA where we pull out a long molecule of DNA. And then we add these two special enzymes called restriction enzymes. And every time one of those enzymes comes across a particular sequence of DNA, it cuts the molecule of DNA. So they go along the genome, cutting it into pieces. And the frequency that those cut sites occur, those restriction sites for the restriction enzymes occur, is fairly random. So some of them might be really close together, or some of them might be really far apart. And that results in us having lots and lots of fragments of DNA, but they can be of different lengths. And what we can do, the first step we do, is we make sure you've got a special adapter and barcode attached to each of those fragments of DNA. And that allows us to reconstruct to which individual those fragments belong. Now, we don't want our fragments to do lots of different sizes because that makes it difficult to interpret the data, and we want all of our fragments to roughly represent similar regions. And so one of the most important steps we do is a size selection where we exclude fragments that are too short or too large. And then we basically amplify and enrich those fragments um, so that we have many copies of them. We then sequence those fragments. For this study, we sequence them in both directions so that we did paired end sequencing. And this was done at the CGRB at OSU. And then it's not enough just to have the fragments DNA. We want to know uh, which fragments are similar to each other. And so what we can do is we can assemble fragments DNA from different individuals into stacks of similar fragments. And the way that we assemble them into stacks is using a program called Stacks, appropriately enough. And we map them to a reference genome. Now, there is uh, an ongoing project to build an albacore reference genome, and we have looked at it. Um, but it's currently not quite good enough to use. So instead, we mapped our fragments to the Pacific bluefin genome. And that's the sister species to albacore tuna, so it maps quite well. 
So we've got lots of fragments, stacks of fragments going along the, DNA, uh, along the genome, um, but we want to know how individuals and potential populations vary. So if we go along the reference genome and find our stacks, we look at each position where we have a stack and we refer to that as a locus, and we see if individuals have differences in their DNA code. And for each locus, we look, we only take one difference. So if there's one position in the genome, such as in locus one here, where individual one has A's and T's and individual two just has A's, uh, we take that variation and remember it, basically. And we refer to that difference as a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP. And because we only used one SNP per locus in the study, I'm going to treat them as being interchangeable. Um, but basically, we find each of these positions, each of these life cycles throughout the genome, and we, we record differences throughout all of our stacks. And gradually, as we build up these differences, we'll be able to tell really subtle differences between individuals and potential groups. So, DDRAD is advantageous because you can get a lot of data from organisms that you don't know very much about from previous genetic research, um, and it's fairly cheap but it does generate a lot of data. So for this uh, sequencing project of 308 individuals, we got over 3 billion reads of DNA. And so we have to have quite a complicated analytical pipeline. And we have to be really conservative and cautious in how we filter and interpret the data that we're getting. So I'm not going to go through all of this in detail. If anyone wants to know about all the parameters and stuff that I use, I can talk about at the end. And there's lots of not to trial and error. Um, but kind of the main point is that we do a lot of strict filtering where we filter for things like genetic linkage when two lice are really close together and so they're likely to represent the same aspect of variation. And we do things like filtering for coverage depth where a position or a locus in the genome doesn't have enough reads and so we're not likely to be confident of the genotypic variation we're observing. But one thing I do want you to keep in your mind is that we analyze the data iteratively. So because albacore are a highly migratory species, we need, to give it, we need to give this pipeline some groups to begin with. So for instance, in our first data set, we did give it the 12 sample areas as potential populations. But um, if those groups are completely inaccurate to the actual genetic pattern in the data, it makes sense to actually reanalyze it and go back through the pipeline. Because then we don't violate a lot of the assumptions and the statistics involved. So we did this pipe, we ran through this pipeline multiple times and changed the number of groups, number of individuals to see if we could eke out different aspects of variation in our data. And another thing that we did is we partitioned putatively adaptive and presumed neutral loci. So what I mean by that is that adaptive loci are positions in the genome that are likely to be under selection. And the variation you're, obser you're observing for those loci is likely to reflect some kind of selective pattern. So, for example, if you imagine a um, fantasy example here, we've got two potential populations where one is in warm water and one is in cold water. And it could be that locus one is selected for, depending on temperature. And so in the warm temperature, it's selected for the A base, whereas in the um, population two, it's selected for C. And so there's a really strong difference because the variation for that genetic locus has a strong impact on your response to the environment. But neutral loci are not under selection, and so they just tend to accumulate stochastic or random changes among populations. And we typically think of that in terms of genetic drift and gene flow. So in this case, the environment's the same, the allele's not under the base is not being changed by the environment, there's no selection. And so with individuals living and dying, they gradually will accumulate changes. Um, but it's not reflecting selection. So using those types, two types of variation, we can interpret the data in different ways. Um, adaptive loci are likely to show us differences between population traits and the environment. Neutral variation is likely to tell us more about um, how populations are connected by, connected by migration. So I'm going to go through the results now. So like I said, we analyzed the data in lots and lots of different ways, but I settled on three main data sets after going through it lots of times. So in the first data set, I did enforce the 12 sample areas as potential populations, and we got about 6,500 lysi. 
when I then reinterpreted the data, I used North and South Pacific groups. And this data set gave me a lot more life site, gave me around 13,000. And then I also wanted to look at differences between males and females. Now, we only had sexed individuals from New Caledonia, and so we only used those individuals for this data set. So it's only 30, 54 individuals rather than the 308. But for that data set, the groups were males and females, and we got around 7,000 ISI. And one thing just to keep in your head, um, because we've been changing the groups, even though the numbers are similar, those 7,000 LISI are not necessarily the same as the 6,000 odd LISI for the 12 sample areas, because they're reflecting the male and female groups rather than the 12 sample areas. So, was there temporal variation in our data? So, when we classified all 308 individuals in the 12 sample area data set um, by sampling year, we couldn't observe any really strong, meaningful pattern. So we don't think that sample year had a strong impact on our genetic variation. And when we also classified individuals into age class with juveniles and adults, again, we couldn't see any strong pattern. So what the plots you're looking at are principal components analysis plots, or PCA plots, and they just visualize variation among individuals for genotypic data. So we don't think time is having a strong impact, it probably has some impact, and obviously the ideal study would have sampled the same locations in the Pacific, you know, at multiple seasons for multiple years, um, but we don't think it's having a really strong impact in our um, sort of haphazard sampling for this study. Next question is, did sex matter? So when we look at all 308 individuals in that 12 sample area data set, we can classify individuals from New Caledonia as males and females, we can classify the sample areas of Hawaii and the Philippine Sea as being likely male biased because they're old fish and most females at that point have unfortunately died. Um, and in the remaining sample areas, we don't know the sex of samples. And when we look at this, there's no obvious um, differentiation of the sexes and all groups seem to generally overlap with one another. And when we look at only New Caledonia, Males and females also can be differentiated, even when we designed, we estimated the data set based on those groups. So moving on to perhaps a more interesting question, is there spatial variation? So again, we're looking at a 12 sample area data set, and we've got all individuals classified according to their sample area. And the first thing to notice is that no single sample area was in isolation from all others. So every sample area overlapped at least one other. And in addition, the northern and southern west coast groups didn't seem to be distinguished from each other. So you can see that in red with Baja California to northern California from BA to CN. And they're overlapping with the points in yellow or amber, which are Oregon, Washington, British Columbia in the northern group. So we don't seem to have strong evidence to separate those potential stocks. But one thing that is quite obvious is that the samples from the South Pacific shown in black with NC for New Caledonia and TS for Tasmania were quite easily distinguished from the North Pacific. But if it was just the difference of North versus South Pacific, you'd think there'd be two really obvious groups in the data. But when you actually look at it, there's actually really three groups when you look at the loadings principal component one, which is just uh, x-axis. And we label these clusters on the PCA plot as cluster A, B, and C. So cluster A was dominated by individuals from the North Pacific. Cluster C was dominated by individuals from the South Pacific. But cluster B was actually a fair mixture of the two. Now, we obviously have a big sampling bias towards the North Pacific, and so we have fewer South Pacific individuals within that cluster B, but it does seem to be a mixture of the North and South Pacific. And we'll come back to this later, but this kind of pattern suggests there might be some kind of genetic admixture between the North and South Pacific. In addition, though, well within the sort of genotypic space occupied by cluster C, we had four individuals that were sampled from the North Pacific that seemed to have very strong South Pacific genotypes. And the most likely explanation for these individuals is that they are migrants from the South Pacific to the North Pacific. 
But the overall pattern in this 12 sample area data set is that there's, there are potential North and South Pacific populations. So we reanalyze the data instead enforcing, based on our sampling, North and South Pacific groups. We got a lot more life side, but the pattern in the data was very similar. So you can again see that the North and South Pacific are separated from one another, but again we have this sort of middle cluster B between the two of them. So those plots were using all of the LISI, but we wanted to know if there are adaptive differences between the two. So in the 12 sample area data set, we estimated that there were 32 putatively adaptive LISI. And in the North and South Pacific data set, we estimated that there are 84 putatively adaptive LISI. So these numbers are really low, but it's not necessarily surprising. Um, well, you're not expecting to detect thousands and thousands of your sequence lysite to be under selection. Um, but you can see that in the male and female data set, using just the individuals in New Caledonia, we didn't detect any putatively adaptive lysite. And the way these lysite are detected as being putatively adaptive is that we use four genome scan programs. And basically, they find lysite that are highly differentiated between your potential groups. So, we didn't think there were putatively adaptive differences between the sexes, but we did find putatively adaptive lysi in both the 12 sample areas, among the 12 sample areas, and between the North and South Pacific. However, when we actually look at what those lysi are, um, all but two of the 12 sample area putatively adaptive lysi are within the North and South Pacific 84 putatively adaptive lysi. So the prevailing trends in the data is that there's a difference between the North and South Pacific. And I'm going to focus on that for the rest of the talk, but I can always talk about any other patterns in the data as well afterwards. So we've seen these differences and we've noticed an overall trend in the data, but how different actually are these groups? So again, we go back to that pairwise um, fixation index, pairwise FST. And if we compare the northern, uh, the North and South Pacific using the 84 pieces of these active life side, we have a FST value of 0.4, which is really high. Now, it's not necessarily a surprise that it's high because the way that these putatively adaptive lysi are identified in three of the programs that we used um, uses FST, but it gives you an idea of the strength of the difference between these groups. So point four is really high. Using the remaining almost 13,000 presumed neutral lysi, we had a really low FST value. Now, it is technically statistically significant, but once you have this many lysi and this many samples, it's likely to become statistically significant by itself. So we don't think that's especially meaningful. We don't think the neutral ISI really distinguished the North and South Pacific. And just to give you an impact, an idea of the impact of those putatively adaptive ISI on the genetic data, when we use all of the ISI, just by adding in those 84 sites back to almost 12,000 ISI, we get an order of magnitude higher pairwise FST, um, and the result is statistically significant. Another way we can visualize the differentiation between the groups is by using a discriminant analysis of principal components, or a DAPC. So using the 84 putatively adaptive life site, we can really easily distinguish the North and South Pacific with almost null overlap between the two groups. Using the presumed neutral life site, which again, almost 13,000 sequence, um, we can slightly distinguish them, but there's a lot of overlap between the two oceans. And then just by adding back in those 84 putatively adaptive lysi, we have a pattern very similar to the you know, putatively adaptive lysi on our own, and the two groups can be distinguished to very little overlap. And another way we can investigate the genotypic variation among our samples is by using genotypic clustering in a program called Structure. So unlike DAPC, you tell it what your groups are, and it tries to maximize the difference between those groups. Whereas in structure analysis, it doesn't know what your groups are, and it just tries to estimate genotypic clusters of variation based on the data among your individuals. It doesn't know what your sample groups are. It doesn't know what your potential populations are. It just finds what the pattern is in the data, and then you compare it to your groups of interest. And what you can see is that um, each bar vertically that's shown in a different line going up represents a different individual. And the amount of color shown for each individual reflects its assignment to one group or another. 
So if an individual is entirely colored in gray, it was almost entirely assigned to that gray cluster or cluster one or whatever we want to call it. If it's entirely in black, then it was entirely assigned to cluster two, um, whatever we want to call it. And when individuals with mixed assignment, it wasn't as confident where to put that individual. So using the 84 putative the adaptive ISI, the optimal number of clusters by under the structure analysis was two. And the two groups quite closely matched our North and South Pacific groups. When we used the presumed neutral ISI, um, the optimal number of clusters was one. And even if we look at two clusters, there's no pattern matching any of our sample groups um, or the original samples for sample area. And again, if we just combine the data, so we have all of the LISI adding back in those 84 putative adaptive LISI, um, we get a pattern that's almost identical to the 84 putative adaptive LISI on their own. So I don't think that's necessarily you know, too amazing. Like We know that the putative adaptive LISI are the ones that differentiate the groups, but it's nice to be able to see how much they contribute to the data overall. Um, but what you're probably noticing is that even though we do have this sort of uh, black cluster closely matching the assignment of the South Pacific, um, we do have a lot of individuals of around 50% confidence between the two groups. And so we're wondering, are these individuals hybrids between the North and South Pacific? And one way we can look at that is by looking at confidence intervals in structure. So if structure is really uncertain of where to put an individual between two clusters, it will have a really wide confidence interval when it puts an individual around 50%. But if an individual really is just about 50% genetic identity between two groups, then the confidence interval should be fairly constrained for those individuals. And that is what we observe to most individuals that are around 50% assignment between the two groups. And like I said, we've come back to those cluster B individuals. And sure enough, pretty much all of those individuals occur within cluster B on the PCA plots. Now, we don't know what, the, the, we know that these individuals potentially have some kind of genetic integration between the North and South Pacific. But we did try to take this, the analysis a bit further. And so we did an analysis in a program called Gene Class 2, which attempts to identify F1 hybrids. And four of our 45 individuals were identified as being F1 hybrids. And an F1 hybrid is a first generation hybrid. So it's likely to be 50% genetic identity between the two groups. Now, four out of 45 isn't a resounding yes for saying that all of those individuals are hybrids. But the analysis also isn't great at detecting individuals with low, um, a lower level of genetic admixture. So if some of the fish had, say, a, they're mostly North Pacific, but they had a South Pacific grandparent, they're not likely to be necessarily identified by this extra analysis. So the overall results indicate that um, we probably do have at least some hybrids between the North and South Pacific, um, but probably more needs to be done on a more nuanced analysis in the future. So lastly, um, we detected these ATP or putatively adaptive differences, but like, what do they mean? What are they? So we took our 84 putatively adaptive lysi and we compared them to sequences from many different organisms available online using a BLAST search. And of those 84, 31 of them mapped to, uh, of those 84 lysi, a lot of them mapped to 31 unique genes. Now the reason why 31 is lower than 84 is that quite a lot of lysi mapped to the same gene. And when we look at the function of those genes, we find a wide variety of potential functions. So some of them are likely to be involved in the immune system response or response to stimuli. But I really don't think we want to get too carried away with this analysis yet because to get, to get quite far removed from the actual organism of albacore. So even very closely related organisms can have quite different genomes and how they use their genome can be very different. Um, so I don't think these functions really mean too much, of, you know, they don't mean too much at the moment. Um, but it does indicate certainly that a lot of these putatively adaptive lysi are likely on protein encoding genes, which makes them more likely to be adaptive because they're actually available as a phenotype quite often. Um, and so more really needs to be done with an albacore genome in the future. So for the conclusions. Um, overall, the genetic data indicates that we've got two North and South Pacific populations, 
Uh, we have really low genetic differentiation for most of the lysi that were presumed to be neutral, but we have really high genetic differentiation for a small number of lysi. Um, many of those lysi do occur on protein encoding genes, and they are, we think they're likely to be under selection, but really to look at the function and adaptive significance of these regions, we need to have an albacore genome, and hopefully that will be coming soon. Um, but I think importantly from a management of conservation perspective is that these groups do manage, ma match the current fishing, fishing stocks with a group in the North Pacific and a group in the South Pacific. But we do have the caveat that the genetic data does indicate that migration occurs across the equator. Um, so we did identify four individual samples in the North Pacific that had South Pacific genotypes. And in addition, we had quite a lot. We had 45 out of 308 individuals that seem to have some level of genetic admixture between the two. And certainly more needs to be done to analyze that more carefully, but we could identify some of those as potential first generation hybrids. And uh, the important thing, from, I think, from a fishing perspective is that a lot of, there wasn't a lot of evidence prior to this of migration across the equator. So it's not been demonstrated by previous tagging studies. Um, and then catch rates for albacore in actual equatorial waters are really low. So this is an example of genetic data providing hopefully some improved insight for how to manage albacore. Now we didn't find evidence of population substructure on the west coast. We couldn't distinguish those northern and southern stocks along the west coast. Um, but I think the evidence we've got here isn't necessarily that the previous studies are wrong. I think it's just a difference in sampling. So those previous studies are primarily all based on juveniles because that's what you catch here. And it's entirely possible that there are different juvenile stocks, but those differences just don't persist throughout the lifetime of the albacore. So simply these juveniles are occurring in different places and growing at different rates and having these phenotypic differences. But once they become adults and migrate, they're become, potentially becoming part of the same reproductive population. And so we're not seeing genetic differences. Obviously, if we had really fine scale, more planned sampling, maybe we'll be able to detect a very subtle difference. But we, I analyzed data in lots and lots of different ways. And no matter how I cut it, I still couldn't find any difference between these groups. And then we also didn't find evidence for genetic differentiation between the sexes. So we certainly think, um, and there's lots of evidence to indicate that Antina's sex has a genetic basis. Um, but the regions of the genome associated with sex aren't introducing a significant bias um, in our population genetic data, such as to skew things like pairwise FST. And we also didn't observe um, differences between males and females directly when we looked at them from the Caledonia. So this is good because uh, a recent study of, I think, yellow pentina was highlighted as an example of a study that could have been biased by biases in sex sampling. And so we think that so genetic studies using a similar method to the study aren't likely to be affected by such a bias in albacore. So I've just got a few thoughts of future research. Um, firstly, we really need to know more about where albacore spawn. So we can say that there are these populations, but how many spawning areas do each of these populations have? Is there just one big spawning area for the North Pacific and one big spawning area for the South Pacific, or are there many more? And then is there site fidelity among these spawning areas? And does that affect the potential for migration and gene flow? And how does that affect stock composition? So for instance, if people are catching albacore of Hawaii, uh, most years are they catching mainly North Pacific albacore, but uh, some years are they catching a lot of South Pacific albacore as well. And so it's got to be taken into consideration, I think, that fish are moving between these regions. And we really need to look at it on a more fine scale sampling at potential spawning areas if we can identify them. And then, like I said, albacore are already being affected by climate change. So they are already migrating earlier in the North Atlantic. And there are probably effects happening in the Pacific that we're not aware of. Um, and a lot of mod recent models, such as the one by Hodia Al in 2015, have predicted that the recovery of albacore to my the negative effects of climate change depends on their potential for adaptation. And it's possible, it's not guaranteed, because there's a lot of complicated things to do with selection, but it's possible that the putatively adaptive life I identified here might be relevant to how these species cope with the effects of climate change. And we do think they should be investigated further. And in particular, it raised the question, is there a different potential to respond to climate change between the North and South Pacific? 
And uh, like I said, we're collaborating with people at CSIRO and also in the South Pacific and New Caledonia. We already shared samples and we're planning to combine data in the future. So hopefully um, the methods used in the study will get to be applied for all of the distribution of albacore in the Atlantic and in the Indian Ocean as well. We can combine our data. Um, a recent study came out sampling primarily, primarily around New Caledonia and our results have aligned really nicely with theirs and we actually have um, some of the same life side that appear to be under selection. And uh, there are improved genomes for bluefin and albacore on the way as well. So I think there's a good future in store for albacore research. And I just want to say that I've really enjoyed my time at Hatfield and uh, Hatfield Marine Science Centre has a long history of doing research on albacore and uh, I'm sure people can recognize some faces here and I'm hoping that I'll be just one step in a long line of people working with the fishing industry and trying to help the conservation of this beautiful species. So if you've got any questions, let me know. Thank you. Uh, from this data. So because we, we were hoping when we compared the New Caledonian individuals we would be able to detect some just by having a male and female group, but we didn't find any. Um, but uh, there, it, the Pacific Bluefin Genome Study, this one, they've actually identified male specific markers in Bluefin and they haven't actually, the paper's out but the genome can't be downloaded yet. Once we can download the genome we can see if any of our reads map to it. So we're hoping we can best get up further and do like a follow-up paper. Um, and I've heard that they have tested it on albacore and it does work. Um, but it, whether we've captured that, that region of the genome really depends on the enzymes that we use. So it's a bit random. But yeah. Yeah. Can you elaborate on your idea about the juveniles being separate stocks but mixing as a delta in breeding? What yeah. mechanism would keep that? So. I think it's, I would, I would suspect that what happens is the albacore are carried planktonically. They settle in particular locations on the west coast and I don't know what decides that. Maybe that has got some kind of genetic basis. But they then have differences based on their environments and their growth rate and things like that. And depending on what they eat, that affects their multilith microchemistry. But then once they start migrating, they're just all reproducing together. And so even if there is a small genetic difference that could be related to where they decide to settle, maybe or some kind of selection on their fit foraging preferences in those locations. Maybe it's just drowned out by the fact that once they migrate, they're all just intermingling and breeding together. Is what the dominant evidence is all those microchemistry not genetic. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. So there's certain programs available where you don't have to or you don't need a reference genome to uh, call yeah. essentially yeah. 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 So I did that. Um, so we tried a lot of different genomes, and then I ran stacks loads, loads of times. And the problem is, uh, basically, reference mapping was way better than uh, doing a de novo assembly where you don't have reference genome. We got way more loci. I did look at those loci, and. What you can see is the pattern we got is pretty similar. So again, this is using a de novo assembly. We've only got about a thousand loci, um, but we still have a North and South Pacific trend, but we couldn't distinguish that middle group. I did do some mining through the data to see if the middle group could be some sort of sequencing bias by using the reference assembly, but I, it didn't seem like it. I think it's just that middle group appears more because we've got more data and we have a greater insight rather than it being a bias, but it'd be interesting to see if that holds true in future. So yeah, the overall pattern was the same, but we had fewer lice so, and they were less reliable, so I stopped. <laughs> and it took ages to process, like that took, what was it, it was like that took 30 days to process, whereas the reference mapping took a day, so I stopped. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you see any, uh, any specific changes in the loci you think were under adaptive selection? No, because uh, I didn't look at that, but that would be really cool to see. I mean, I did just take a PCA and map the age classes on, but I didn't actually try running it through stacks, for instance, with those groups. Uh, I think one problem is that we have a, a lot of the fish we don't have size measurements for, 
and so we can't be really confident of their exact age. And so I don't know how accurate any kind of groups would be. And it's the same reason why when I did the temporal groups, I used sample year and I didn't try and do season because it got very complicated to try and work out which individuals would be in which groups, especially when you got North and South Pacific. And I think it could be done, um, but it might be better to have more controlled sampling and be more confident of which, to which groups individuals should be assigned. You know, I was wondering if it might give you some insight into the adaptive directionality of the interchange between North and South. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. I mean, I definitely did notice that the interesting thing is that the four migrants, they're a mixture of juveniles and adults. So, um, I mean, obviously, did they, the adults could have migrated as adults, but did they migrate as juveniles? And the juveniles are there. So, did they have South Pacific parents that both migrated and happened to you know, produce a pure South Pacific offspring? So, yeah, it'd be really interesting to do more subtle analyses like that. Any more questions? <laughs> well, if there's no more questions, I allude to the explanation. I allude to the fact that Felix is only in my lab for another 24 hours. We <laughs> catch him on flight to New Zealand tomorrow night. Uh, we start the second postdoc at the University of Chicago. So uh, this evening at 5.30, we're going to meet at the Tech House to drink some beers and celebrate with Felix. So you're all more than welcome to join us. Yeah, thank you.